Good morning and um, welcome everyone to the workshop future topical updates to the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Next slide please. My name is Susanna Rodriguez and I am the program officer here at the academies and I've been coordinating this workshop with this um, planning committee. Um, and now I would like to just uh, start by just um, Reminding everybody that um, today this meeting is being hosted by the Board on Animal Health Sciences Conservation Research, also known as BASCR, um, within the Division of Earth and Life Studies and the, the Standing Committee for the Care and Use of Animals in Research. Next slide, please. I would like to start by first thanking our sponsors for supporting the workshop and the Standing Committee. I would also like to um, let everyone know who is participating today that a summary of the presentations and discussions made during this workshop will be prepared by a rapporteur and it will reflect what transpired at today's workshop. It will be prepared in accordance with institutional policy and procedures and will be published by the National Academies Press and made broadly available to the public. As a reminder, all views presented in this summary are those of the workshop participants. Next slide. I would also like to remind everyone that the National Academies prohibits all forms of discrimination, harassment, and bullying. This policy applies to all participants in today's activity, and the policy is available for viewing at the National Academies website. Next slide, please. I'm very grateful for the one the high attendance and interest this workshop generated. We have over a thousand participants. And I would like to let all of our particip participants know that a session discussions will include time for audience Q&A. For our participants, please use Slido to submit your questions. And questions that we can't get to today will be answered and posted to the event page within two weeks. Also, speaker bios are posted in the meeting book, and the meeting book can be found on the workshop event page. Next slide, please. Um, these are the breaks that we have for today. We'll have a morning break, a lunch break, followed by two afternoon breaks. And uh, another reminder that a recording of this workshop will be posted on the event page within approximately two weeks of the workshop, and you'll receive an email notification when it is made available. And then finally, any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone during this webinar are those of the individual and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Now I'd like to introduce one of our workshop co-chairs, Dr. Jeffrey, um, Jeffrey Everett. I'd like to welcome everybody to this workshop. Um, I'd also, um, next slide. I'd like to thank my co-committee members uh, on the workshop planning committee. Uh, there were 10 very hardworking members uh, of this committee, as well as my co-chair, Dr. Jennifer Lofgren. Next slide. Uh, you can all read the statement of task um, for this workshop. Uh, this workshop will be in part uh, putting out the work of the standing committee um, uh, and re recapturing uh, the stakeholder interactions that the standing committee had with uh, stakeholder groups uh, relative to the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. Uh, it's quite a diverse um, workshop. It has a lot of topics, and these topics were uh, emanated from the major topics that came out of our stakeholder interactions. So. Um, next slide. With that, I'd like to introduce my co-chair of the workshop, Dr. Jenny Lofgren, who will go into the mechanics of the workshop. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we're really looking forward to a phenomenal two days, um, as was mentioned, that have been um, raised for focus areas through the standing committee's work with the listening sessions and also the Vic Ross survey. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the general um, agenda that we'll be um, hosting over the next two days. Uh, today, we're in day one. We'll start with a presentation on the workshop charge and listening session of the data, uh, and then going through three sessions, starting with challenges of using the guide for regulatory purposes, then use of the guide and performance and st uh, engineering standards. 
tomorrow, day two, uh, we will then uh, go through sessions four through eight, uh, including key topics in housing and husbandry, global impl implications for the guide, emerging issues for the guide, the format of the guide, and then managing programs of the future. Next slide. Um, this morning, we're going to be starting um, our workshop with uh, the charge and listening session data. And I just want to remind everyone the speakers will be um, briefly introducing themselves before their topics to keep things um, moving in a timely fashion. So if you can all share your name, position, affiliation, and your presentation title. And your moderator, uh, starting off with me, will remind you when you have about two minutes left in your sessions. Um, so with that, I would like to... Um, it get us started. Uh, so Dr. Disco, if you can lead us in historical perspectives of ILAR um, and the use of the guide. I would be glad to, Jenny. Thank you very much. Uh, I am pleased to be leading off here this morning with just a little uh, presentation about the uh, tr <clears throat> transition from the Institute of Laboratory Animal Research to the uh, Board on Animal Health Sciences conservation and research. Next slide, please. So I, I animated this thinking I'd be driving it. So I'm going to apologize because I'm going to be asking for things frequently. So um, ILAR got established back in 1953 as the Institute of Animal Resources. Next. The la word laboratory got added to the title in 56. And then it became the Institute of Laboratory Animal Resources, or it went from the Institute of Laboratory Animal Resources to the Institute for Laboratory Animal Research, and that was in 97. Next. Um, and it has been part of the Division of Earth and Life Studies for over a decade. Next, please. Okay, so in 2017, the uh, National Academies performed what was termed a rapid market value assessment on all of its work related to animal research and welfare. So that is uh, ILAR plus some other issues. Um, I will be um, honest, I did not post the, put this in the presentation, but several of us were concerned that this was going to be the end of ILAR as an institute. Continue, please. Um, one of the steps in that assessment was to interview internal and external stakeholders. And I can let you know that members of the ILAR Council and ILAR Roundtable at that time uh, were asked to be parts of that interview. The main conclusion of the assessment was that there were some opportunities for the academies to look into big complex problems in four broad animal-related challenge areas. And those are, next, Biomedical issues related to animal models and or alternatives, which was ILAR's traditional area of expertise. Next, conservation research and decision-making to address losses of biodiversity or extinction. One health approach to improving human health through the greater understanding of the linkages between human, animal, and environmental health. And finally, sustainable, sustainable systems for food production from animals or alternative sources of protein. Okay, so those are the four areas that were looked at. Okay, next, please. So in addition, the National Academies created the role of Director of Strategic Initiatives on Animal Research, who would then also be by default the Director of ILAR. Um, that also came as a result of the assessment. Uh, the first individual to hold that role was Dr. Teresa Silvina. In 2018, we began efforts to change the membership of the ILAR Council to include some people who would be representative of the new avenues that were within ILAR structure. Next, please. And so by 2020, the ILAR Council and that should say council. I've been trying so hard to remember to say board that I put it in here inappropriately. ILAR Council was comprised of four individuals representing laboratory animal and comparative sciences, three individuals representing wildlife conservation, and three individuals representing One Health. Next slide. Um, it was also decided at the time to keep livestock issues primarily within the Board of Agriculture and Natural Resources, uh, but with an opportunity for cross-board activities. 
with the change in the membership, there was discussion of having a name change to better reflect the scope of the new uh, mission. And, and I can tell you a lot of the push for the name change came from council members themselves um, because the being on the Institute for Laboratory Animal Research was not reflective of their roles at their respective institutions. Next slide. So the one thing that was sort of automatically agreed was that there was a general consensus that we should be a board. And there was two reasons for that. The first is that all of the equivalent entities within Dells and most of the entities within the other divisions were boards. And secondly, no one was quite sure what the designation Institute meant. Um, it was felt that it implied something different from a board and in some eyes, possibly lesser than a board. So we decided to make ourselves a board so that we were equivalent to everybody else. A lot of potential names were circulated. Several were brought to Dells and brought to the National Academies for consideration um, and were not chosen. And the winner was Board on Animal Health Sciences, Conservation and Research. Next slide. There is a debate afoot about how to pronounce the acronym. Next. Some favor Basker, like the lizard that you see here. Others favor Bosker, as in Baha for sheep. Um, and it, Bosker is um, preferred for two reasons. One, it brings the H into the pronunciation. And second, the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate is Basque. And so it was felt that Bosker would be make it more clearly separate from, from uh, Basque. Um, but as you'll probably hear throughout the next two days, it'll be pronounced both ways still. Uh, some other interesting notes. Um, there is no comma between health and sciences. It's actually board on animal health sciences, comma, conservation, Oxford comma, and research. Next. Um, an interesting thing that I found while being on the website is that uh, spell check at one point made it the Animal Health Sciences Conversation and Research Board. Um, while we want conversations to be a major part of our activities, we were not concerned about putting that in the name of the board. So if you see that, note that it's conservation. The main things that I want to get across today is Basker or Bosker is ILAR. It's big, just bigger and better. The idea was that we do more, not that ILAR gets shrunk into a smaller corner within a, the same entity. Um, next. And the other thing that we agreed on at our last uh, board meeting, animals are the focal point of this board. Okay, that's what's going to differentiate us from the other boards. And it's also going to help us make a help to make us collaborative with the other boards because we will be able to bring to bear um, some aspects of looking at the animals as the focus rather than focus being on um, other aspects of health and uh, environment. So with that, I will take any uh, questions if they've come up already. If not, I wish you all a great morning, and I am looking forward to the next two days and seeing what the Standing Committee has found and where we are headed in our adventure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. No questions as of yet. Um, and so I think we can continue on with um, Janet Garber, who's going to be sharing perspectives on the eighth edition guide process. Yes, good morning. My name is Janet Garber. Um, my background and one of the reasons I'm participating in this workshop is to give you a little perspective on the process that was used um, by the committee to update um, the guide some 13 years ago. I was a member of the committee to revise the 1985 guide which resulted in the publication of the seventh edition of the guide. 12 years after that, I was appointed as chair of the committee to update the guide for the care and use of animals, which resulted in the eighth edition. So this morning, I would like to share with you a little bit about the process that our committee used uh, in updating the guide and maybe some thoughts on potential approaches 
uh, to the future topical updates um, of, of the guide. Uh, first slide. The timeline um, of the update of the guide was essentially started in 2005 when NIH had a request for information. Based on that, ILAR recommended that the guide be updated. The committee was appointed in 2008 and given a statement of task. Uh, briefly, um, during that period, we solicited written comments. We had three open meetings in Washington, D.C., California, and the Chicago area. A letter report was submitted then to ILAR or by ILAR to NIH with topics to consider um, by the committee for the update of the guide. Over a period of two years, the committee held um, a number of meetings. During that time, we requested information from experts in particular areas. At the end of um, that period of committee meetings, um, the draft of the updated guide was provided to 17 independent reviewers. And uh, at the end of the year 2010, a pre-publication copy was released. In early 2011, the eighth edition was published. And following that, we had a rollout of the guide with informational meetings. And in 2012, early, the eighth edition was officially adopted by OLA and published in the Fed Federal Register. Next slide. Our committee's statement of task was to update, not revise, the 1996 guide. It was to provide new scientific information, to review the published literature, and determine where or if new guidance was warranted. The statement of task included to maintain performance standards of the 1996 guide. This was a very important part of that statement of task. The update was also to remain consistent with public health service policy, the Animal Welfare Act regulations, and the panel on euthanasia. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the concept of performance standards was introduced in the 1985 guide, and it was further defined and emphasized in the 1996 guide, the seventh edition. In the eighth edition, there was an expanded discussion throughout, emphasizing flexibility and professional judgment in the implementation of performance standards. The committee tried to have a better definition of desired outcomes and more guidance on how to achieve those outcomes. But maintaining the concept was considered essential and was reinforced during our public meetings in written comments and during the entire review process. Next slide. Our committee deliberations, uh, we reviewed written comments and information from open meetings. We solicited expert opinions in uh, a number of areas. We did a close look at USDA policy versus the guide to address potential regulatory uh, issues. And we also looked at the EU directive at the time versus the guide. We spent a lot of time, um, including uh, expert opinions were solicited on rodent cage size and so on. Um, we looked at many other areas. We defined and the terms must and should provided definitions and how they were to be used in the guide and interpreted by readers of the guide. And all changes or updates um, that were made in the text and so on were scrutinized by the committee and by the reviewers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Our review process following um, the draft document was provided to 17 reviewers and two uh, 
review coordinators appointed um, uh, by the National Academies. Some of the reviewers were asked to focus just on specific sections, but um, were provided with the entire document and could certainly comment on any other sections um, of the document. All written comments and suggested changes were addressed by the committee. The pre-publication committee was released in late of 2010 and then published in 2011. Next slide. Following publication of the guide, uh, committee members, uh, ILAR and uh, academies took, took this on the road. Uh, in April, um, first off though, uh, a letter was sent to the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine in order to explain some of the approaches and some of the recommendations that were made in the guide and some of the areas of the guide that had been updated. A similar letter was sent to OLA um, with discussions of some of the areas that had been uh, updated. In June, ILAR uh, provided, had a webinar uh, meeting uh, and members of the committee were able to uh, present information uh, that was included in the update. That summer, we also held a joint meeting in the Washington DC area with ILAR and OLA just to discuss the changes and the impact that it might have um, on uh, implementing the eighth edition. In October, ALAC formally adopted the guide for use in their accreditation program and published uh, a number of frequently asked questions regarding interpretation of the guide uh, in some areas. And we took it on the road to local and regional meetings. Uh, we went to the Federation, uh, Asian Federation of Laboratory Animal Science to give an international perspective, National ALAS meeting, the Scientist Center for Animal Welfare, Primate Veterinarians, the ACLAM Forum, uh, a number of ALAS branches, uh, National Capital Area Branch, Research Triangle Branch, Chicago Branch. And we had members present uh, information at a number of the Charles River short courses. Next slide, please. What I want to do is present a little information on the, the concepts that were reviewed and emphasized uh, in the eighth edition. First off, an engineering standard was defined as a standard or guideline that specifies a detailed method or technolo technology or technique for a achieving an outcome. It did not provide for modification in the event that acceptable alternatives might be available. And engineering standards are prescriptive and provide limited flexibility for implementation. Next. A performance standard, on the other hand, is a standard or a guideline. While it describes a desired outcome, provides flexibility in achieving that outcome. And it's a essential that the desired outcome be clearly defined and appropriate performance measures regulatory, regularly monitored to verify the success of that process. Next. So <clears throat> when comparing engineering and performance standards, the key to evaluation and oversight of all aspects of the program, uh, it puts a burden certainly on administration of the programs to do that. But ideally, engineering and performance standards are balanced. Um, they set a target for optimal practices, management, and operations, but encourage flexibility and judgment based on individual situations. Next. So performance standard remained a key concept in application of the guide. There was overwhelming support for this approach the committee tried to provide a better definition of desired outcomes and more guidance on how to achieve the outcomes. It does require a high level of sophistication uh, by an institution. It empowers them to leverage their expertise and make decisions that are specific to program needs. Next slide. In addition, 
practice standards. I want to talk a little bit about this in applying professional judgment uh, to implementing performance standards. We need to take into account the application of professional judgment over time. And that is which has been demonstrated to benefit or enhance animal care and use. And practice standards evolve over time. That's what's happened, you know, I'm sure, between the publication of the eighth edition and uh, and today is how we use utilize the guide in our institutions. We implement performance standards in our institutions. We monitor and we evaluate them. And then we share the information. We present it, we publish it, recognizing that what we do in our institution may not fit all situations, but may illustrate an approach useful for other institutions. So clearly, modification of practices and procedures with changing conditions and new information. Next slide. So in the eighth edition of the guide, um, there was careful consideration of some of the terminology. While there aren't a lot of requirements in the guide, it is a, a, a guide and provides guidelines and recommendations. There were times when the use of the term must uh, was considered uh, appropriate and must would indicate an action that are considered to be imperative and are a mandatory duty or requirement. The guide defines should indicating a strong recommendation for achieving a goal. However, individual situations might justify an alternative strategy. And the word may indicates a suggestion that might be considered. Next slide. So if you look in the eighth edition, the word must is primarily used for program, programmatic issues and in cases of um, guidelines for animal, that re, regard animal welfare, uh, regulatory and legal requirements, program requirements, uh, as in having an occupational health and safety program, having a program of veterinary care, and that individuals must have must have training and experience in the areas in which they work. For procedures for emergency care, there must be timely reporting and expeditious assessment and authority of the veterinarian and veterinary consultation uh, in times where pain and distress uh, is noted beyond that which is anticipated. Next. OLA actually uh, did a review and made some interpretations of the use of the word should. And they basically concluded that should statements often involve performance standards. And they did not consider that the established performance standards to be a departure from the guide. So an institution may elect to follow a different course of action, perhaps, if that action results in an equivalent outcome and is reviewed and approved by the Animal Care Committee at the institution. Next slide, please. So in applying performance standards, an institution really needs to define their outcomes, determine what the objectives are and how the objectives will be achieved. There are many ways to achieve those goals and they also have to determine how success will be measured. Are those performance standards meeting the goals appropriately. <clears throat> and then modify practices and procedures with changing conditions and new information. Applying performance standards um, has a high degree of flexibility associated with it. The next slide, please. In the next several slides, I would like to just give you an example of uh, one of the th uh, areas that the committee looked at very closely. And it was in an attempt to define recommendations and provide more information and guidance as to how to achieve the desired outcomes. And this is related uh, in this example to cage and pen space. The eighth edition provided new recommendations for mice and rats with litters and in some categories of non-human primates and rabbits. This edition 
the committee expanded discussion of considerations for housing, applying performance standards and how to do that. The tables included more comments with additional information that was provided in the text accompanying those tables. Next slide. So a couple of key points of explanation um, for Cajun can pen space at a minimum animals much have, an, have enough space to express natural postures and adjustments. And you can read this to have access to water. Cage height should take into account the animal's typical posture, uh, providing adequate clearance for the animal from structures such as feeders and watering devices. And there should be sufficient space uh, for mothers with litters to allow pups to develop to weaning without detrimental effects. Next slide. So in the text surrounding cage recommend, space recommendations, performance standards were addressed, noting that an animal's space needs are complex and that the tables contain recommended minimums that consideration of only the animal's body weight or surface area may not be adequate. Determining the space needs should include age and sex of the animals, the number and the duration of housing, the intended use of the animals, and special needs of groups and individual animals. Next slide. There's discussion about space, al space allocation be assessed and reviewed and modified as necessary by the Animal Care Committee, and certainly input from uh, researchers and the veterinary staff considering specific performance indices such as health, reproduction, growth behavior, activity, use of the space, and certain special needs by the characteristics of a particular strain of animals or species and the use of the animals. Next slide. For example, in for rodent breeding, uh, the table provided recommended space for a female plus a litter. And it was consistent with the current standard of practice in some breeding operations, uh, particularly those using commercially available high density housing racks. In the table, it, it's explained that this is intended to be a starting point for addressing space needs of breeding groups. The guide did intentionally did not indicate specific needs of other breeding configurations thus allowing institutions to determine appropriate housing conditions for their own situation based on performance indices discussed throughout the document. And the guide did not suggest that the minimum space recommendations for other breeding groups are additive to that indicated in the table, or that the recommendations for like-sized group housed rodents be used in determining the space needed for other breeding configurations. Again, this is applying the performance standards defi as defined, uh, defining the outcomes um, by the institution. Next slide. So that for rodent breeding groups in the table, there's a statement that other breeding configurations may require more space and will depend on considerations such as the number of adults and litters and the size and age of the litters and that other configurations may require more space, but they may not. Other considerations may, may include culling of litters, separation of litters, uh, more intensive management of the space. Although again, su sufficient space should be allocated for mothers and litters to allow the pups to develop to weaning. Next. So how was it suggested then that these guidelines be used in the application of the concept of performance criteria? So for breeding groups of mice, uh, it was suggested and interpreted to use the recommended minimum space as a starting point. In some cases, inbred strains with very small litters may not need more than uh, the recommended space, 
However, it's possible that outbred strains with very large litters uh, may need more. For other configurations, um, it, it was pointed out that uh, standard size has become a standard practice for many breeding operations. However, the housing situations may change and many factors may help determine whether or not desired outcomes are met. Next slide. So for performance criteria in defining outcomes, some things to consider for breeding groups of mice, the size and age of the litters, the need for culling or separation of litters, the sanitation frequency, and basically management. So uh, this was provided as an example to you of what our committee did um, in the process of updating the guide to prov provide more information for the user of the guide to implement performance standards and uh, more information on how to apply that process to their own institution. The committee also provided in the eighth edition um, much similar discussion in many other areas um, of application of performance standards to various aspects uh, of program management. This occurs throughout the eighth edition and in other areas related to management as well as veterinary care uh, and other aspects of the program. Next slide, please. So I wanted to provide just a, just a little bit of perspective um, maybe to be considered for the current standing committee uh, tasked with uh, the potential uh, to uh, update the guide uh, in some way. Certainly a topical update is being considered. Some of the areas to consider um, based on the evolution of our research programs over the last decade and experience and basically changes in the standards of practice Additional guidance may be considered and may be needed, uh, perhaps in the area of social housing, in the use of agricultural animals and research. I wanna note also that agricultural animals was a, a large topic of discussion by the previous committee, because at the same time our committee was um, tasked with updating the guide, the guide for the care and use of agricultural animals was in the process of being revised. So we had a number of discussions with members of that committee and how to uh, address agricultural animals in the care and use of uh, those animals in research situations. And so the committee made a concerted effort to uh, reference the Ag Guide and to utilize the concept of performance standards, uh, particularly in um, those situations using uh, typical agricultural animals. We also would anticipate that there have been a lot of changes and more information that can be provided uh, about wild animals and field research, also perhaps aquatic species, and perhaps in other unique animal species and research situations. Next slide. So I think the challenges um, for the standing committee <clears throat> are to look closely at sections of the guide that discuss various approaches and options to meet intended goals. And I think part of this workshop in the next uh, couple of days will be to look at areas of the guide that have prompted a lot of um, discussion over the years, um, have prompted institutions to make changes and decisions related to their programs. And so the tasks then and challenge is to provide additional guidance if it is needed in applying standards of practice where things may have changed. 
um, over the years. Certainly review published information to determine whether or not new information uh, would be appropriate um, uh, for the guide and consider how basic concepts and recommendations can be applied to any species. The guide is meant um, to be applied to many species. It's um, applied to any program, uh, small programs, <clears throat> large programs, and the whole concept of flexibility and the ability to work out how the guide can be applied to your program uh, is what has made the guide really a lasting document over the years. Next slide. I think we should also remember <clears throat> to maintain the concept of performance standards and professional judgment. They've been working for years. We're getting better at it, certainly. And that all programs are very different. Uh, one size does not fit all. The pr principles throughout the guide do allow application to different species, different research objectives, and different program needs. And then just finally, next last slide. The guide has been accepted and successfully applied internationally. And the continued use of performance standards and professional judgment is working. So I wanna thank everyone for uh, inviting me and, and I hope that this workshop um, will be able to uh, sort out some of the things uh, where we can uh, Im improve the guidelines that are provided in this document and uh, make it in fact uh, a living document that we can continue to use successfully as we have been for, for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garber. Um, we have one question that's been posed. Um, given your leadership through the crafting and implementation of the eighth edition of the guide, what is your hope for what the ninth edition can achieve that is in addition to, or maybe even different from what the eighth edition achieved? Dr. Dr. Garber, Garber you're I think muted. you're muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I think there's an opportunity to provide more information in certain areas that have um, come up in the past or in the past several years um, with certain programs and how to effectively um, apply the guide in certain unique situations. And I think um, more examples, perhaps, of how to do that uh, might be appropriate. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, we did have some addition questions come in about the future edition of the guide that I think uh, might be better answered by Dr. Fox. So we'll bring those in after his talk. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to then transition over to Dr. Jim Fox, who will be giving us an overview of the work of the standing committee and the listening sessions. Thank you, Jenny. It's uh, it's great to see everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, it's as uh, Susie mentioned earlier, the attendance at this workshop exceeds a, a, a thousand people. And must note that we've gotten people on the West Coast up early this morning. So hopefully they're attentive to the uh, next session and uh, thanks Jan for your excellent overview of uh, the eighth edition of the guide and how it's been successfully implemented over the years through various institutions that subscribe to its importance. So um, let's have the first slide please. So um, the, the background of the guide is such as we we uh, most of us today appreciate. It provides guidelines for institutions to develop their animal research programs that support high quality science 
and also importantly humane care of, of labs under the under the various auspices of these institutions and uh, it's required for federal compliance for the US public service policy and it's important resource for the federal government and research institutions worldwide to shepherd and overview the various processes of, of research in academic or in other uh, uh, entities across the United States and indeed globally today. So um, it's an important document, as Jan mentioned earlier, for ALAC international accreditation. And uh, as this slide indicates, 550,000 copies have been printed since its first publication. So that's very impressive. And translation into eight different languages. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, publication genesis of the guide. You can see back during its, uh, its inception in 1963, it consisted of only 33 pages. It was updated in 65 to add another 12 pages to 45 pages. And then you can see uh, chronologically that the first um, six editions of the guide were sponsored by NIH. And then the seventh and eighth edition, NIH and other sponsors were responsible for the seventh and eighth edition, uh, the seventh being 125 pages and then it uh, it uh, doubled in size to the 246 pages that we just heard Jan outline the uh, progress and the finalization of the eighth edition, which we've now been using for uh, obviously a number of years. People are anxious for the ninth edition to occur. So the standing committee was formed. We'll have the next slide. So uh, in regard to the, up, the need for an update, uh, we have very active IACUCs that ensure animal studies is conducted in accordance with the guide. These are of important nationally and indeed internationally. And uh, we heard Jan talk uh, about the definitions and the, and the genesis of should, must, and may. And those, I must say, having sat on a number of animal care and use committee over the years, that is still a very contentious and has different interpretations depending on the committee that you're uh, sitting with. So it's an issue that the standing committee has grappled with under in different uh, sessions. Uh, and it still, uh, in my opinion, defines or requires further clarification. So it's also important to note that we introduce new species having diverse physiologies and behaviors. And um, clearly science moves at such a rapid pace that the 2000 edition, 2011 edition, there were only 15 references to transgenic, four references to, to the term knockout, and no references for CRISPR technology that we all appreciate has been introduced recently and allows for a very rapid genetic modification of species in question. So uh, again, during the period of 2011 to date, many laboratory animal organizations and researchers uh, don't have a lot of opportunity to put their viewpoint about what they considered vague or uh, statements in the guide that should be updated. So the, the issue comes before us is uh, a time for a total rewrite of the guide, but this obviously raises uh, practical and daunting requirements. So that's under discussion and consideration should be given to a new platform model for the guide that is translated to a living document that would increase accessibility for users and potentially more frequent updates. So those are items which the standing committee has been asking various uh, entities during our 
our uh, standing committee listening sessions over the last two and a half years. So the next slide, please. So uh, this, by definition, is a new approach to updating the guide, and it, it Im implies a new improved process to evolve the guide over time to address limitations and need for updating, uh, and particular involvement of scientific communities to have their input. And it provides an ongoing resource to expert and timely insight and knowledge for institution and their staff. And it monitors and identifies issues to the public health service on humane care. Uh, that is, allows us for updating on reviews, gather and evaluate information, and identify new distribution platforms for the guide content. Slide, please. So uh, with that background, we uh, established, the Academy established a new standing committee for the care and use of animals in research. And these uh, are, are being governed by a statement of task. Their 13 members have been appointed by the Academy of President, uh, President and a convening body not constituted to write reports but, or to make recommendations, but to assess the state of knowledge, the areas of concern in our community that dictates the necessity of a new uh, a guide or the ninth edition of the guide. And importantly, provides a forum to discuss issues related to the enhancement of animal well being, importantly, the quality of research and advancement of scientific knowledge and methods of implementing a phase iterative review revision cycle for scientific evidence, and to discuss platforms for the guide content and related products to strengthen competence, timeliness, and usability and accessibility of this information. In other words, a facile document that can be updated regularly uh, with informed scientific background. And so these are topics which may be considered for any future updates of the guide and related products. Next slide, please. Uh, this, for your information, gives the uh, membership of the standing committee. Our first uh, convened meeting was in the summer of 2021. So we've been involved in this process for uh, two and a half years. And the committee, I must say, it's been a pleasure working with the various members, all of whom were selected for their expertise in certain areas that are relevant to our discussion about the need and uh, discussion regarding the ninth edition of the guide. Next slide, please. So where, where are we in the standing committee? I just mentioned we've been in existence for two and a half years. And we've had a number of listening sessions convened through our friend Zoom and it allows these frequent meetings. And we've, uh, I think at the latest count, uh, we had 26 different listening sessions convened with various scientific organizations, governmental agencies, uh, certainly uh, uh, heavy influence of academia and uh, of, uh, pharma. And we've been taking elaborate notes and discussions during those various listening sessions over the last two and a half years. And we're now embarked on phase two. And that's the purpose of this workshop uh, for the next two days is to share input from these listening sessions and to gather information and dialogue with the participants of the two-day workshop. Uh, which we've just now undertaken. And, and the next phase three is what we uh, consider in naming a consensus committee. And this uh, looks at the various information that has been accumulated and they develop 
uh, a study on key subject matter changes and updates for the new guide and related products. And then phase four is ongoing discussions through convening activities to explore areas for future updates of the guide. So this, uh, th though it's been since 2011, since we've had the eighth edition, we're getting there. We're get <laughs> we're making progress. And uh, I'm uh, on a frequent basis asked, well, what is the standing committee doing? So hopefully this gives you an idea that the standing committee has been very serious in the charge that they've had to develop uh, a set of, of questions, important questions, issues to take forth so that the consensus committee can be formed and get to the business of how that new guide is going to transpire and be implemented. So uh, again, we're in 2024 and uh, we have 2025 and they're in uh, to develop a written document or what form this new ninth edition takes on. So can I have the next slide, please? So this just gives you an example of the various listening sessions. We've had a very active participation, and I must say uh, a very committed interest from our colleagues in the scientific community about issues that they would like to have addressed in the ninth edition. And this just, again, gives you an example of those various listening sessions that were organized uh, during this two and a half year period. So uh, we could have the next slide, please. This gives you an idea of the participants and their backgrounds. You can see of the 355 participants, we had a, a, a considerable number obviously over half of them uh, being veterinarians. And also I think a, a very impressive number of PhDs, a smaller number of MDs, and of course other uh, interested parties that were involved in IACUCs or other management programs uh, in their various institutions. So uh, again, uh, a wide swath of, of uh, individuals with uh, very salient and important co uh, comments that they wanted to give to the standing committee. Next slide, please. So it's important to look at their backgrounds. I, I mentioned uh, the uh, various educational backgrounds, uh, the uh, whether they're in basic science, translational science, how many were IACUC members, and uh, again, those involved in IACUC activities. So again, uh, a, a considerable number of individuals. Next slide, please. So uh, super uh, session participants, uh, supervisory roles, again, as one would expect, we have veterinarians, administrators, uh, principal scientists, uh, who either sat directly on the IACUC or were involved in uh, uh, animal-based research, uh, director, division heads, et cetera, and research and scientific staff. Again, uh, an adequate, in our mind, an adequate number to get a broad uh, appreciation for issues about the eighth edition and moving forward to the ninth edition. So next slide, please. So uh, this is where we are. We're at the, uh, we've just convened the, the workshop this morning. And this workshop importantly uh, is a separate committee, has their own statement of task, which uh, uh, Jeff gave us a, a brief overview this morning. And the purpose again, is to share uh, acquired information that we've developed, we that we, the standing committee, have developed with our various constituencies over the last two and a half years. And this workshop will serve as a source of information for the development of the statement of tasks for the ninth revised edition of the guide. And the workshop will produce proceedings and briefs summarizing the presentation and activities of this two-day event. 
Next slide, please. So the consensus study is upcoming. It'll be a separate ad hoc committee appointed to update the guide. And the academy staff will generate a proposal containing the statement of task, project budget, expertise of the consensus committee. Uh, potential sponsors will be approached with proposals for feedback, revised uh, proposals submitted to the uh, academy leadership for approval. And importantly, importantly, once 70% of funding is committed by the sponsors, the project can be initiated. So that's obviously a frequently asked question of the standing committee. When do we new, move to the next phase of the actual writing obligation? And that is embodied in the consensus uh, study committee that's going to be formed. The committee can then uh, form its uh, activities they're, they're appointed through a public call for nominations, and the committee will meet and hold information gathering during the study process, much, I believe, in the manner which Jan uh, uh, went through with us on the 8th edition consensus and development of the 8th edition. And they'll deliberate and make their recommendations on guide changes. Next slide, please. So this just gives you a, a, a timeline. It start the summer of 2024. As I just mentioned, the uh, study uh, is defined. You have sponsorship. You have the committee selection, their meetings, and then you have information gathering, drafting a report, report review, report release, and then report dissemination of a new guide. So uh, a lot has been happening in the last two and a half years, and hopefully the workshop will help uh, solidify that information so that we can move forward with the actual consensus uh, committee and their uh, writing assignments. Next slide, please. So this uh, phase four is overlapping from phase two. So this standing committee, importantly, so everybody understands, will stay in existence and provide a forum for further information, uh, perhaps further workshops, which will help educate and guide the new uh, uh, writing committee, the consensus committee. So uh, this uh, standing committee in ongoing discussions will uh, further uh, assess future updates to the guide, discuss issues related to enhancement of animal welfare, identify topics to be considered for future updates in the guide, and design methods for implementing phase review processes. So again, the standing committees had an important objective. That objective will continue and hopefully uh, we'll have dialogue with the consensus committee, which will actually be assigned the, the writing and the actual implementation of the ninth edition. The next slide, please. So we'd like to thank uh, the staff, Susie and uh, her, her colleagues that work uh, tirelessly here at the Academy to help us formulate our, our commitment to the to the uh, ninth edition of the design of the guide. And uh, if you have questions, you can reach out directly to Susie or other members of the staff uh, for those updates and questions. Next and last slide. So here we are, folks. Here's my <laughs> here, here's a good re reflection of where 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 we've been going, where we're gonna go, and uh, it brings to mind the classic movie, uh, Michael J. Fox there, uh, the title Back to the Future. So thanks for your patience during this two and a half year process. And we're uh, certainly anxious to answer any questions that may arise as a result of our activities over the last two and a half years. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Fox. So that was a really helpful overview of the process, where we've been, where we're going, what we can expect next. Um, we've actually had quite a few number of questions come in, um, and uh, some of them have themes. Others are standing out alone, so we're trying to process them live. I think um, one question was, do we anticipate there'll be opportunities to leverage large gatherings of stakeholders for soliciting feedback, meetings like ALAS or scientific meetings like SOT or Society of Neuroscience? Yeah, thanks, Jenny. That, that's a good question. Actually, uh, this, uh, I didn't mention this, but the standing committee did have a formal session at ALAS, not this last year, but the year before, and it was done in conjunction with the Veterinary Consortium. So I, I would imagine, though I can't speak for the consensus committee, uh, that they may want further dialogue with the general uh, constituency, scientific organization, SOT, ALAS, AB, ABMA, et cetera. So that's a possibility. I don't have a direct answer, but certainly a good suggestion. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I think some of these questions might be explored further throughout the, the workshop itself. So questions like, how can a regularly updated or living document be effectively used and implemented by bodies like OLA and ALAC that traditionally use something that's more static? So uh, I do think we have a number of speakers speaking to that, but is there anything you'd like to share at this time on that topic? No, but it's certainly going to be a topic of, uh, of debate as it was with these various listening sessions about the actual format of the guide. Is it going to be a living document, a static document, or some combination thereof? So Importantly, as you point out, Jenny, that will be discussed through the next two days. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've had some other questions that uh, will be interesting to explore how to address things like um, when do we expect the publication of the ninth edition um, and do we have a sense of what the budget will be um, required so we know what that 70 percent looks like? What uh, interesting unresolved questions. I don't have firsthand knowledge to that at all. <laughs> Obviously, uh, I'm not uh, involved in the the uh, funding process, and uh, I, I would think that the dollar amount's going to be, uh, you know, a reasonable uh, number. I can describe to it, and uh, I could ask Robin if she'd like to comment about that fundraising process, but. Um, and I don't know uh, where we are in that set, reaching that 70% goal, but I'm, hopefully it's uh, now that summer is approaching, that it's uh, uh, being aggressively pursued by the Academy so we can meet those goals so we can go to our next phase of the guide uh, ninth edition. Robin. Thanks, Jim. Um, so we've been waiting for a long time to to come to this day to the workshop. Um, it's a critical meeting for us because, in fact, we hope to leave this two day session with a a start on crafting a statement of task for the next for the next guide. And based on what the complexity of that um, and what we th think we're going to pursue, that actually kind of determines really the dimensions of the budget. Right. Typical academy re, uh, uh, consensus studies range anywhere from about five hundred thousand dollars to about a million, um, and that so that's just just kind of giving you a ballpark there. But um, really, it depends on how many meetings we are going to have. Maybe we will be able to use some of the meetings um, by the the associations that are stakeholders in this process. Um, so. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, work to be done to craft what the uh, the future guide is going to look like, and the and the better we do that, the better we can I think move forward with our our sponsors. So, thank you, Robin. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, so it was raised uh, in uh, Dr. Garber's talk around the remit for the eighth edition as to whether it was an update or revision. Do we have a sense for the ninth edition if the remit is aligned with that update or revision? All uh, items to be discussed with the consensus committee. <laughs> so we're a fact finding group. Uh, certainly we would like to have dialogue with the consensus committee, but 
again, the actual structure and uh, format of the ninth edition is to be determined. Okay, thank you. You're so efficient with that answer. We actually have time for one more. <laughs> um, so it seems like the eighth edition revision process was jump started by a 2005 NIH RFI. What has their involvement been with this current update process? Should we expect something similar? I plead innocence or <laughs> ignorance, I should say. I don't. Honestly, um, I'm going to turn that back maybe to Susie to answer. Well, I'd like to say that the NIH has been involved in the process. And one of the things that I'm going to follow up after this workshop is actually um, put out a listening session summary book of all of the sessions we've had. And as you can see, that the NIH was heavily involved and they participated in five sessions. And in those five sessions, you know, we had a mix of people who work on the NIH uh, ACD working group, as well as people um, who were NHP and rodent users, uh, attending and clinical vets. So yes, yeah, so they have been involved. Um, and, you know, we've also had presentations from Janet Harbour addressing questions of the standing committee um, actually twice in the last year. So, you know, they've been um, very helpful in making sure that we move this process along. And I would like to add that the standing committee is still asking the public um, for you to participate and provide us input. Mariah will go ahead and put the link in the chat um, for you to access um, an, a, a worksheet that you can provide your input on your feedback on, you know, what you would like to see in the next edition of the guide, as well as providing references that you think should be incorporated on things that, you know, may have not existed or things that have been updated since the, la since the last guide revision. So, you know, be on the look for that. And of course, you know, there'll be opportunities to interact with the consensus committee, as well as the standing committee going forward. So, um, Yes, I didn't mean to say that NIH hasn't been involved in the listening sessions. It clearly was, but the statement about it, 2005 RFI, I don't know anything about. But certainly, just to emphasize Susie's comment, they they have been and continue to be very involved in this whole process of listening sessions and answering queries, et cetera, that the standing committee has evoked throughout this process. So. Yes, very, very heavily involved and appreciated their involvement. Excellent. I'd like to thank all of the speakers that have contributed to the program thus far. We're now going to be taking a break until 1025 a.m. East Coast time.